So I'm Tommy Shane and I'm Head of Impact and Policy at First Draft. And for those that don't know, at First Draft, we protect communities from harmful information. Now, it's my job to make sure that different people like reporters and fact checkers and platforms know what they need to know in order to tackle misinformation effectively. Now, as you can imagine, psychology is a really big part of this. And that's because it can help us understand how people respond to what they see online. Now, this is really important, not just to make sure that we maximize the impact of our work and make sure we're having a positive impact, but it's also important to make sure that we're not doing more harm than good, which is a real risk for us working in this space. Now, beyond that, it is just a really fascinating insight into the human brain and how we all think. So I'm hoping that today's conversation is going to be really interesting for a number of different reasons. Now, to pin this down into something slightly more concrete, because psychology can be quite abstract, um, I wanted to share with you a favourite fact of mine that um, I've come across in, in my own research. And this is the fact that the same statement is more likely to seem true when it is presented in a rhyme, delivered in a familiar accent, and printed in high contrast colours. Now, these three facts might seem random or disconnected, but they're all to do with an idea called fluency. Now, fluency is a psychological concept that describes how easily we process information. Now, this becomes relevant to misinformation because the more easily we process information, the more likely we are to think it's true. So this has a number of implications for how we should be thinking about responding and designing content for online consumption. Now, to help understand points like this, I wrote a three-part series covering the most important concepts in uh, psychology as it relates to misinformation. It's a kind of dictionary of definitions because it is easy to lose track of what all of these different terms and concepts mean. Um, and you can access that at firstdraftnews.org forward slash psychology. But today we have the immense privilege and pleasure to speak to some of the world experts in this field. And I'm really excited to be able to have this conversation with them. So what we're going to do is we're going to try and tackle the, the big concepts, the ones that you really need to know, um, and explain them and make them a bit more accessible. Um, we're going to answer the big questions. So I've got a bunch myself, and um, I'm sure you do too. So please do share your questions through the chat function, and um, I'll be able to put them to our guests um, on your behalf. And third of all, we're going to leave you some really concrete tips. Um, because, like I said, everything can be quite abstract. And we want to make sure that you can leave this webinar um, with something that you can implement either at work or just in your day to day life. So, without further ado, um, I'm going to introduce our panelists. Um, so, first up, we have Bryony Swire Thompson. Um, Bryony is a senior research scientist at Northeastern University and a fellow at Harvard. Um, her research primarily focuses on corrections and how they can be designed to maximize impact. So for all the fact checkers and the reporters on the call, um, you're going to really want to direct your questions at her. So um, welcome, Bryony, and thanks very much for joining us. Um, next up, we have Gordon Pennycook. Uh, Gordon is assistant professor at the University of Regina and what has worked previously at Yale. His research is focused on the ways we use gut feelings versus more analytic ways of thinking and how this relates to misinformation. And he's done some really interesting work on um, nudges as well. So any technologists or um, platform people here are going to want to listen carefully to Gordon. So thanks, um, Gordon, for, for joining us as well. And um, last but not least, we have Nadia Brashia, who is a postdoctoral fellow at Harvard. Um, and she studies the cognitive shortcuts that people use to evaluate truth. Um, and her more recent um, research has been published um, uh, just a couple of months ago is on um, why older adults are particularly susceptible to misinformation. So I hope to touch upon some of this with her as well. So welcome Nadia and welcome to all of our guests. Thank you so much for joining us for this conversation. 
Um, so I thought I would open with a question that is kind of the most important first question to ask really, which is um, why should we care about psychology? Why does it, why does it matter for people thinking about um, misinformation? Um, and Brian, I wonder if you can kick us off. Yeah, sure. And hi everyone. It's uh, so nice to be here. Um, I think I'm always, uh, I always struggle to answer this question because I'm incredibly biased as a psychologist. I'm like, well, isn't this the most important thing? Um, but I think anytime humans are in the mix, it's important to consider um, information, like how they're processing the information, like cognition, how you're thinking. Also, obviously, emotions are important. And I think uh, we differ to some of the other fields in terms of um, trying to look at more established paradigms maybe like previous research. And we also like to measure things. I think that's the only thing. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, Gordon, is, is, does that, some of that resonate with you? What, what do you feel like is the key, the key reason um, for, for psychology being important? The bias part resonates with me. Uh, <laughs> um, although I think um, it's particularly important to like consider psychology because as humans, we have our own ideas about like why people do things. We have lay theories uh, and intuitions. And without research, we will feel very confident that we know what's going to happen and what's a good plan forward. Um, if we don't do any research, then we'll make errors. Um, and so like, the, we have blinders when it comes to our own psychology. Um, and that's why it's particularly important to, to research it because you know, errors are more, more likely in most scenarios. Thank you so much. Um, and yeah, no, I think biases are probably something we're going to be touching upon a few times in different ways on this call. Um, and Nadia, what, 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 what kind of sticks out for you? Does this, does this, does this, do you feel that you're biased as well? And what is it that we, uh, why is it that we should be thinking about psychology? Definitely also bias. I can relate to what Brian was expressing, but I do, I would agree with Gord that there is a gap between how we think that we think and how we actually think. Um, and that can be useful for both individual users to know and for platforms to take into account when they're coming up with strategies to kind of address this problem. Mm -hmm. um, and one of, the, one of the things about the, the, the way we think we think is um, to do with, um, it's also to do with age as well. So there's, there's all of us think in certain patterns and we have certain biases, we have certain trends, but we, um, but, but not all people are the same. And I think it's very easy for us working in media literacy and things like that as well to, to assume that. So I wondered, Nadia, because your research focuses on this question, could you, could you talk to us a bit about who is most at risk um, from misinformation and a bit about the reasons, reasons why? Sure, so one of the strongest predictors of people engaging with and sharing fake news specifically political fake news is advanced age. So older adults are more likely to see political fake news in their feeds and they're seven times more likely than the youngest users to share it. Um, at this point, we don't have a lot of conclusive evidence for why that might be, um, but we do know that some of the sort of lay intuitions about why could be wrong. So I think it's easy to default to the perspective that Older adults suffer from cognitive impairments, such as memory troubles, um, maybe attentional issues, and that that's a big reason why they're sharing so much fake news. Um, I would push back against that perspective to say that the research doesn't exactly align with that and that we should probably be considering other factors like social and motivational aspects and also digital literacy issues. Because mm, I was reading that um, trust generally increase with age, increases with age, for example, um, which is not something, which is quite optimistic. I quite liked that, <laughs> that, 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 that was true. Um, but there could be some social reasons for this as well, I suppose, um, your social networks as well. Right, so trust is one important factor and, and that increases both in general and for almost every kind of social partner you could imagine. So older adults trust strangers more than young adults do, as well as people like family and friends. So there's trouble with detecting deception. There's this general trust and the belief that people might be being more honest than they are, but also changes in our social networks and who we're interacting with. 
So as we age, we tend to interact with fewer sort of weak ties. Um, you can imagine the acquaintances you have on Facebook that maybe you've never met. They're friends, friends, friends. Um, older adults are probably less likely to have people like that in their um, Twitter accounts that they're following or their Facebook friends. So they might be coming to their news feeds and their timelines with more trust um, from a starting position of trust, assuming that close friends and family wouldn't share fake news. Because mm. I guess we've all got that kind of friend or ex-friend from school who we, we, we don't trust and they share stuff. But I suppose if, if you're much closer to all of your friends on Facebook, you, Facebook might be more of a, a, a place where you trust content than, than for right. other people. Um, and then I think it's really interesting as well to think about this in relation to, as I was saying, media literacy, because we, we think a lot about schools um, and we don't think a lot about, um, you know, think about high school and things like that. Um, but how we reach people, um, I think, is a, and how we get, get that older population that is seven times more likely, I think you're saying, um, I think is a real, real challenge for us. Um, and I wondered as well, you know, when we talk about these things that we, um, we, we draw upon, you know, how much we trust people who are sharing things. Um, there's a really important concept in, in, in a, a psychological literature on how we think about truth, um, which is cues and heuristics, which is like a really horrible word because it's really complicated. Um, but I wonder if you could just talk a bit about that. I mean, we, we, we use cues to decide what's true. Like, what does that mean and what are cues? Right. I think about cues as just any kind of information that we might use consciously or unconsciously to decide whether something is accurate. So in my work, I think a lot about things like a truth bias. Are people starting from a neutral point or are they assuming that the content they see and the things that they hear um, are more likely to be true than false? So we see this, this bias towards accepting information, for example. So that's the sort of cue um, because most of the information we see or hear in our daily lives is true. So from, from that perspective, it's fair to assume in a lot of contexts that that can lead us astray in say a social media environment. Um, but then things like gut feelings, which I'm sure Gord will talk more about too. Um, feelings provide information. We might not always be aware of that, but things like fluency, feeling like information is easy to process. We interpret that as evidence that the claim in front of us is true. Um, and then there's the cues that we wish people relied on more, things that we would have to retrieve from memory, things that are a little more effortful, like where did I hear this information from? Or what are some political facts, for example, that I know that I learned years ago that could be relevant in this situation? And, and I think the, the one that really jumps out at me, the, the, the cue that always jumps out for me is thinking about, you know, bbbc.co.uk, some kind of false impersonation of the BBC website. It's kind of using the brand as a cue, right? To kind of, um, to, 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 to draw on the trust that you have with that logo or that name, then then you'll accept the information. And it's a good example, I think, of how cues can be intentionally manipulated in order right. to deceive people. Um, and yeah, we've been doing a lot of work on, on labels and things like that. And just when you think of a social media post, there's just all this different information, like when it was posted, who's posted it, what their photo looks like, when they're verified, there's just so much for us to take on board. Um, so yeah, I think thinking about the manipulation as well is, is, is I'm sure will be um, relevant for our, for our reader, uh, for our um, audience. Um, so I wanted to kind of um, switch, switch gears. When we, th we thought about like what makes people vulnerable, how people make these decisions about truth, who's most at risk. Um, I want to kind of come to this question of corrections um, because I know it's going to be one that people really care about and Bryony knows so I'm going to be coming to her on this. Um, she's, uh, Bryony's done a huge amount of work on corrections and, and um, how we can, um, what, what tips we should be using when designing things like fact checks. Um, but I wanted to, um, before Bryony gives her, us her kind of concrete tips of what, how to do the corrections, um, I wanted to tackle straight on uh, a very contentious issue, the most contentious issue in the psychological literature, I, I think it's fair to say, which is the backfire effect. Um, and it's caused lots of, you know, <laughs> intrigue and confusion, I think. So I'm wondering, Bryony, are you able to provide some clarity for all of us? What is it and what do we need to know about it? Yeah, sure. Um, I think the first thing is exactly what you said. It's it's a term that's being used incredibly inconsistently, not just outside of academia, but within academia. 
And so I think we're trying to you know, nail down more than ever this, this idea of what a backfire means. And it, it has to be either something that go that you know belief increasing relative to a like a pre-correction baseline or a between group baseline. But so frequently this is it's not used like this. Um, even when talking to you know colleagues, they'll say, well, this backfired, and you'll kind of look at the data and it's like, well, it's not actually increasing uh, mm -hmm. belief. So I think if you ever read, you know, academic papers, it's good to kind of think about that in those terms. Also, um, there's a number of different types that are floating around. And I think the two most popular are uh, the worldview backfire effect and the familiarity backfire effect. So the worldview um, stems from this like motivational, like reasoning um, literature. And it's when people increase their belief um, due to some kind of like uh, either uh, they hold a belief really strongly or they feel like this, their self, their identity is being threatened and they increase. So there was initial um, evidence for this, but we now call actually all backfire effects. We use the term that we don't believe that they are robust empirical phenomenon. And what that actually means is that either in the case of the worldview backfire effect, um, we really struggle to replicate it, um, even using the exact um, uh, statements and items and measurements as in previous studies uh, or when we try under these like what we call theoretically favorable conditions we just don't find it. Um, then there's this familiarity backfire effect which is you know the same outcome in a way and beliefs still increase uh, but they're to, due to different psychological mechanisms. So for the familiarity backfire effect the rationale is because I've repeated the initial misinformation within the correction, this kind of repetition boost um, will increase belief. So this is often um, conflated, it's often mixed up uh, with another phenomenon, which is very robust that both Gord and Nadia study, which is called the illusory truth effect. So this is this um, repeated presentation of statements, increases familiarity, it's the fluency mechanism that you mentioned earlier, and this is what increases belief. Um, the big difference between the illusory truth effect and the familiarity backfire effect is that there is a correction in there. So when you, when you correct misinformation, this familiarity boost, um, we're not seeing it. So we ne never, never actually see, uh, due to familiarity mechanisms, when you have a salient, a clear correction in there, that things go the wrong way. That makes that that that's that's exactly the kind of clarity I was hoping for. So, so to kind of to, to kind of um, sum that up, we there has been concern around if if we do a fact check or a debunk, yeah. we say the falsehood again, and that says it again in people's minds, it, and then later on they're going to think, oh wait, what was that thing? Yeah. Oh, and then just recall what you were correcting as as a fact. But are you saying that that's not something then the the fact checkers have to worry about? Yeah, yeah. And I think it's, I think the whole notion of backfire effects is really, it's so um, accessible in a way. I think it's a phenomenon that we all can kind of really identify with this idea where you're having an argument with someone and they're digging their heels in and you're like, but this is the truth. And they're like, no. And I just feel like that's something that is very kind of um, identified, like it's very familiar. And I think that the backfire effect rings true to a lot of people, but it's just not something that we can measure well in the lab, especially, and not to get too much into the weeds, but when you compare it with like um, just measurement error, um, when, when you can't measure something and belief is really hard to measure. Um, if we're not measuring things well, what's called reliability. So uh, um, pretty much the consistency of your measure. If, that, if you're not got a good measure to begin with, you might just overinterpret noise as this backfire effect. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, it has been quite, it has persisted, I think. And it's, it's been a difficult thing to unlearn yeah. as a community. Oh, uh, I think it's a, a hilarious, like, like as a meta joke of like misinformation correction. And certainly, and at least it's a positive story. If I tell you it's not true, it's not gonna, gonna backfire. So um, one of the things I wanna ask, and this is a question that I, I really was keen to ask you about. And, you obviously a big thing that we're going to be looking at is, is vaccines uh, and, and trying to debunk around vaccines. We, there's a kind of very strongly motivated anti, um, anti vaccination um, community and individuals out there, a lot of skepticism. Um, 
And I have seen some studies, or at least one, that shows that giving corrections can, um, in the, just in the people that are most against vaccines, um, increase, or sorry, decrease the intent to vaccinate when they're corrected about it. Um, and I suppose this is kind of like a broader question. If there are there exceptions, are there should because because I know it's been established that that is it's not the norm, but there are there are some exceptions. Do we need to worry about that, especially in the field of vaccines, or are we kind of okay to just correct, correct, correct? Uh, yeah, I mean, vaccines like this is it's a, it's a great example because there have been not just one study but several studies showing the back of our effect with vaccines, um, and. I, I mean, you know, as a scientist, you always like want to be very nuanced and couch and it might occur under some circumstances, but we still haven't found these cases um, like oh, consistently. These subgroups um, also with vaccines, like back to that, um, uh, the question of, uh, as I mentioned, this reliability, like um, things are very unreliable when you just use say one, like one, one, one question to measure something. Um, so pretty much, if you just say, uh, do you intend, intend to vaccinate you know, your child? Do you intend yourself to get vaccinated? And that's the only thing you ask people. This is when things have a lot of like error. Um, and in 100%, in every single case that vaccine um, studies have found these backfire effects, they have only ever used one item. In the ones that don't, they use more. That is so clear and so helpful that's so thank you so much for that um, no because i mean it's, it's difficult you know you've got you read all these papers that sometimes they've got conflicting results and there's so many of them it distilling this down into a really clear uh, conclusion can be really tricky so this is a, this is exactly what i've been asked to say thank you um and so i wonder you know it, it, it begs us to ask what tips do you have if the people who are um going to be doing the this uh, a lot about vaccines a lot of fact checks and corrections about vaccines um, and you know more generally than that are there some things that you would say um, that, that's really jumped out and, and especially some things that people might not know but but, but also any, anything you've got for us I'm sure people want to hear. Yeah. Um, well firstly I think the obvious one from you know what I've been talking about the backfire um, is yeah don't be afraid don't be afraid to correct um, even with the the researchers who are uh, in this group who still believe that this is a, this is a, um, uh, it does occur under some circumstances with some people, even they would never say, you know, never correct this type for this group. I think on the whole, we should always be correcting misinformation. Um, that being said, there are better ways than others. And just because you're not getting a backfire doesn't mean that you're getting like the most effective version. Um, so there are a, like a number of, of things you can do there's um uh i think one of the the most popular is what's called you know you fill the gap when you retract a piece of, of misinformation you want to like say what is true and accurate um that can often be really hard especially in something like as new as the pandemic because often we just don't know what the facts are yet um and you know you'll never get a, as good of a belief update if you don't have those kind of um these this factual information um yeah also um yeah i think that's the, that's the definitely the main, the main one i can think of other um no the, the the filling the gap and i mean we we, we are obviously still in the middle of a pandemic and I think that the, what this, the filling the gap really reminds me of is, is right at the beginning of the, um, the, the pandemic when there was a lot of um, confusion and concern around the origin of the, the virus. And that was a big first question lots of people are answering. And the, the fact checkers were in a difficult spot in relation to filling the gap because they kind of could correct misconceptions, but they couldn't provide a positive story, a kind of genesis story. Um, of the the fact so it's it, it's oh, really hard. Kind of perfect form for misinformation. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and there's it's it, it's it, there are yeah there are limits as you say to how much people can fill the gap, but that's still. Really... Uh, um, actually, on on that note, I think like it is always a good practice to make sure that corrective element is really clear and salient, so that even even if people skim, even if people aren't paying attention, no matter what, people don't miss the fact that this is not true. 
I think that that's also something really important. You don't want to like put like, uh, you know, um, 5G towers cause coronavirus in the head in the headline and then, oh, it's not true in the body. You know, like I think mm -hmm. always pairing this idea of saliently pairing the corrective element with the misconception is also um, super important. And I guess as well, even on a headline, getting that tag, you know, false or misleading yeah. by yeah. beginning with the headline, yeah. even that I'm guessing is- it will, will... There, Yeah, I've got to, got to make sure the, the false tag is there. Um, and to, to, to bring this question back to, to, to this question around age as well, Nadia, I, I mean, I'm conscious that we talk in, we, we talk in general terms um, and, 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 you know, partly that, that's exactly what we need to do. Um, are there kind of any things, any tips you have if people are working with older adults, whether it's correcting or helping them understand um, misinformation? There's some kind of nuances in that respect that we should be mindful of. Yeah, I mean, Brian has done some of this work as well, showing that older adults, it may have an especially difficult time with corrections and in general with pairing a piece of misinformation with the tag, the contextual detail that it's not true or it's disputed. Um, so keeping that in mind and using the strategies that we know make corrections more effective in general, like giving detail, um, replacing rather than just repeating um, those things are especially likely to benefit older people. Great, okay. Well, um, I, I wanted to kind of switch gears here and talk a bit more about um, this kind of question of prevention um, um, as much as, um, uh, um, uh, what am I saying? Uh, correction, sorry. So um, the, um, this kind of leads me onto a lot of Gordon's work, which has been on this um, idea of um, of nudges um, and I wonder Gordon could you kind of jump in here and tell us a bit about like what is a nudge and why is it something that people are talking a bit more about um, uh, now than they have been in the past? Um, so in the context of why we're talking about it for misinformation I think it comes down to what I said before about um, understanding the underlying psychology of what's going on and so like most of what uh, has been discussed the kind of errors that people make you know, given that the you know, worldview backfire doesn't seem to be that big of a influence on why people make mistakes, it seems to be that it's mostly kind of a matter of kind of inattention, right? That is, when we're engaging with social media, we're not really in the right kind of mode of thinking that we should be in to like be able to recognize what's true or false. We're just scrolling with our mouths open and it's mostly like pictures of dogs and babies and stuff. And then you see like a news headline and you're not really engaging with it the right sort of way. And then people often don't read the, the story before they share it and they don't probably even think about whether it's true. You know, we have studies showing that like um, people will share headlines without, you know, they, they are, uh, if you ask them directly about whether they think, think it's true or false, they're actually pretty good at distinguishing between true and false content. Like, you know, uh, they think the true stuff is more, like 50% more true than the false stuff or whatever. But if you ask them instead, you know, would you share these on social media? They're terrible at distinguishing between what's true and false. And some, in many cases, sometimes we show that people will actually share that as one group of people who's asked about sharing will share more false stuff than the people who's asked about truth say is true. That people are sharing things that they could identify as being false if they bothered to stop and think about it. And so uh, the, the nudge that we're talking about is a way of changing the way that people kind of think, or at least getting them to think specifically about whether it's accurate before they make a choice for sharing. Um, the idea is that the, the kind of automatic processes that we're going, that are going on, the kind of intuitions people have when they're engaging with like news content on social media, just aren't directed towards accuracy and so forth. But people still do care about accuracy. Like if you ask them directly, almost everyone says it's important to only share accurate stuff. They just aren't thinking about it. And so um, we are coming up with ways to kind of nudge people to think about accuracy. And that, and we've got some evidence that it, it can actually be effective. Yeah, because I definitely go on social media to um, to like, relax a lot of the times, get some downtime, and not because I've been thinking so much my work, whatever. And I just go on, but I guess it is that really tough ask when you know somebody is on there that they're not really thinking, and how do you get them to actually? Um, how do you actually get them to, to to be in a bit of a more skeptical, kind of critical way of thinking? 
Um, and so the, the questions, so is it the, the, the nudges you've, you've kind of been looking at are things like asking people just, do you think that this is true? Is it, is it that kind of thing? Yeah, we don't like tell them to do anything. We just, that is, we don't tell them, use the third camera accuracy now and don't make mistakes. Like there's misinformation out there. We don't do that sort of thing. What we're doing is just triggering them to like, um, to think about the context of accuracy. And so one way to do that is just to like, in our experiments that were actually like in the lab experiments, we just give, ask them a question about whether something's accurate. And then later on, we were asking them like about sharing, but you know, we don't link the two things in the study. They just, having already thought about accuracy, now they're gonna be more likely to think about it um, later on. Or like we did a, a Twitter experiment where we um, have a lot of people follow these uh, bots. It's a long story, but basically what we did is we sent people a random direct message asking them about accuracy, which of course almost everybody ignored, but we still, you know, put that thought about, about accuracy in their head and they and the quality of the news content they shared in the 24 hours after that improved. And so like the so the way you know it's not it's not a particularly complicated mechanism. It's just mm -hmm. people aren't really thinking about that. And if we can do things, ads, you know, campaigns, conversations such as this that get people to think about um, accuracy more. It can have a small impact. Of course, it's not going to solve everything. It's just one little uh, nudge that might make uh, a small improvement. But it's a way to get be more proactive about people's kind of uh, fact checking themselves. You know what I mean? Hmm. And um, you know, I think if there are any people working at platforms on the call or has influence with platforms, I think this is a really tangible thing for platforms to do, and they they already do it. With things like bullying content, you know, Instagram, I think has like a little notice comes off of it to text kind of bullying language. It'll say, you sure you want to post this? Um, again, it's not um, stopping anyone from saying anything. It's just giving a prompt so someone can reflect and think a bit about what they're doing. So um, I think there's a massive, massive room here. The, the, the one thing that Twitter has done is it's introduced, a, or it's testing, I think, a, a little thing that comes up if you haven't clicked on an article telling you to read it. So I think it's a little bit passive aggressive to be like, I haven't actually read that. We know you haven't read that. Uh, <laughs> you should be sharing it. Um, but in a way, I think they, 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 they haven't quite, quite got that, that, this principle that you're talking about. I think it's this idea of asking you to think. Um, so yeah, I would, I would encourage anyone thinking about, um, anyone working at platforms to be thinking about this, this work. Um, and on the, the subject of prevention, because this is about people not sharing stuff. So rather than, so you don't even get exposed to it, you don't even have to do the correction based on this really important principle that pre prevention is preferable to cure. It's like very hard to get stuff out of our heads. So let's just try and not get it in people's heads to start with. Um, we, um, I think we were just mentioning here something about pre-bunking. Um, and um, I, I wonder whether that's something, you know, because this is preventative, this is this idea of pre-bunking, it's also called inoculation. Um, I, um, I, I think maybe, maybe this, there are some kind of other versions of that term as well. Um, and Bryony, I wonder if, if this is something you could kind of pick up um, uh, for us because on this question of prevention. Yeah, sure. Um, it's, I haven't done any work on it personally, but from what I read, it's highly effective. Um, so it is always better to get there, obviously, before than, than after. Um, but it's... It's different from like inoculation is different from like giving people going to say, oh, you're about to be exposed to misinformation. It's not like a warning. What it is, is like it's giving people the tools. It's like teaching them about um, uh, the techniques that maybe either malicious actors or people trying to convince you or, you know, it, it's about like almost training you um, to, to be able to maybe more skeptically. Um, tease apart a fact from fiction. So it's a very, yeah, it's a very different thing. Um, yes, I think Claire Wardle, who is the US director of First Draft, um, was, was talking uh, in this kind of really compelling analogy about um, the fact that lots of photos that were maybe taken like 10 years ago get circulated as if they were true. And people just don't even know that that happens. That's even a thing to be on the lookout for. And she was kind of talking about it in relation to, you know, photoshopping um, models. It's just something that we've now become accustomed to keep an eye out for. We understand that that's something that people do. Exactly. And we need, to, we need to be aware that these tactics are at play. Sure, um, even giving people a vocabulary to be like, ah, that's like, you know, when I, that's a picture from 10 years ago, I understand that. Like, I think it can be really effective. 
Um, so I want to um, pass over to Jen now, and and I think there've been quite a, quite a lot of questions from the audience. So, um, Jen, I don't know if you've been been able to kind of pick any of them out for us, but but please um, please uh, share them with us now. Sure thing. We've had a few good questions actually. Um, I have one here. It says, is a cognitive public health model necessary? If so, can we adapt traditional clinical modalities or interventions, i.e. cognitive processing therapy, dialectical behavioural therapy, and to serve as a form of cognitive prophylaxis? Wow, that is a very uh, interesting question. I think prophylaxis is kind of similar to this question prevention, but I'm going to have to defer to, to, to the experts on this. Gordon, you've unmuted, so do you want to tackle this one? And maybe that, yeah, out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, um, that's a really interesting question. I think uh, to like bring in the public health angle is interesting. I mean, I think that's what education is for. Like, I think that the um, the way that we should be teaching kids in schools skills, direct skills that relate to educating the mind should probably be like specifically, you know, learning about critical thinking and digital literacy and media literacy. Uh, and like, I mean, presumably that is being done in some schools more than others, but it should be, it should be as basic as mathematics, right? Because um, it's almost as central to people's choices. Like you need to use math for your jobs, but also we need to not uh, fall for misinformation. So um, it, I guess, I mean, it is a public health issue, but I mean, so it's, if you, draw out anything else so it's, everything is a public health issue essentially so that would be that, that we have the infrastructure for it we just need to tailor it to, to the you know modern problems essentially yeah that's really interesting to think about health because i know that's a, the, definitely the way that um twitter is thinking about um its conversations healthy conversations it talks about a lot um thank you for such a yeah such an interesting question and can we um can we take another one from from um the, the chat jen So oh. guys, sure thing, I'm back. Um, when you refer to older people trusting strangers more, what range of age are you referring to? And what year did the information, was the information collected? And was the information only from the US? Um, thanks so much. This is, um, yeah, a really helpful set of questions. And I, I, I want to turn to Nadia to answer these, but I also want to kind of pick up on um, this question of the US as well. I think that's a really interesting question about you know, who, who are we sampling and what, what, how should we be thinking about um, the, the participants in these studies? So Nadia, can I ask you to kind of, kind of come to this question on um, age and then please do jump in on this question about the US focus. Sure, so when we talk about older adults in our research, we typically mean people older than 65. Um, in my studies, I typically focus on 65 to 85. Um, the studies on increases in trust have been in the last 10 years and it was not limited to just US samples um, so that was that effect seems to generalize across cultures does anyone want to pick up on this question of US because I know that some of the studies are US focused um, is that something that people should be looking at critically when they read papers or what, what should we do? Brian, you look like you're... Yeah, in short, yes, um, definitely. I think cross-cultural research in this kind of field is incredibly uh, slim. Um, and the only study I've ever done which looks at cross-culture, a study looking at an effect between the USA and the Australia, in Australia uh, which we can consider in terms of like you know, spectrum of the world culture, we would consider at least you know, in English speaking country, maybe more similar than others. We found a massive difference. So I think like you can't always, you know, expect a lot of these things to replicate and the reason for why um, uh, these cross-cultural differences, you know, sometimes don't replicate, I think is not only really interesting, but that would open up a whole other kind of uh, set of research questions as to why, like what, like psychological mechanism um, are we missing in one culture but not the other. Mm -hmm. Can I jump on that, Tommy, as the resident yeah. stadium? Um, one thing that also like there's there's actually a specific, I mean many issues with, with just only focusing on doing this research in the states, but one of it has to do with the political atmosphere in the states isn't isn't particularly representative, <laughs> let's say, of other uh, countries. And I mean some you know with different lots of different ways, but um, part of the narrative in this area at the start was focusing explicitly on politics, and like this conversation now would would have been. 
crazy back then because um, most of what we're talking about now is underlying kind of mechanisms that aren't really about politics. And that what's remarkable is we've gotten there despite the fact that we've been doing these studies by and large in the States. So um, we probably would have got there faster if, uh, if we weren't doing that, but it's, it's an important consideration for sure. Thanks so much. A really helpful question there. Um, Jen, hit us with another one. Sure. Okay, we have another good one here. Um, to what extent should journalism admit uncertainty? Would it create another gap? For example, in Brazil, the official database on COVID-19 numbers of deaths and cases are not qualified. Generally, the numbers are under, underestimated. Instead of just using these database data, journalists write papers on how the data is not enough to clarify the real situation. Mm. So, yeah, it's been a lot of uncertainty thrown on the, the case um, statistics, which is to some extent valid. Um, so, yeah, this is a really, really interesting question. Uh, obviously, uncertainty is really tricky to, to convey. So um, I wonder, Bryony, is this something you can touch on? And please do jump in, anyone else as well. Um, from the research I've seen, people are actually really good at understanding nuance, but only if they're like an attentive, an attentive um, captive audience. So if people are motivated and actually reading the article, they're great. Um, not so sure about if they're just skimming. So, you know, it's really hard to think about what to recommend for best practices. Maybe have like an overall kind of upfront statement, but it's always good. It's like people, are, if they're paying attention, wonderful at, at grasping this new one. So, so I would just to jump in, I would say that um, with few exceptions, you know, like a public health crisis where we need to have um, clear messaging and so on, it's almost always better to communicate uncertainty. And part of the issue is that uh, people are kind of used to or getting more used to or whatever, or maybe they've always been used to kind of simple answers. And maybe if we didn't, I mean, I, I don't have any data on this. This is my speculations as a, just as a person with somewhat <laughs> related expertise. Um, if we were better at communicating, we're more likely to communicate uncertainty that people would be more used to using, hearing that language and might not, you know, be so quick to, you know, uh, jump on jump on things. Um, that's really interesting. I mean, to pick up on a point there, Bryony, you know, it's almost as if you can guarantee that you've got more of a captive audience the further down the article you get because they're more engaged. So maybe that's even, you know, start getting into the weeds of it further down. Yeah, yeah. I think a colleague of mine actually even looked into this, into like looking at how people read different, different types of content differently. Um, and yeah, I think it's, yeah, I think it's important to know like how, where people start and where people stop, for example. And I've read also that there's, um, you know, being transparent about how we know what we know, kind of explain the boxes that can also help. Is that, is, if I remember that right? Uh, do you mean like, like how we know what we know, like metacognition or? Oh, so in a sorry, in an article, in a news article, kind of explaining uh, yeah. like how we how we found this out. Only scientific. That's like a pet peeve of mine when I'm reading an article and I'm like, they're like science says or studies show, and I'm like, I'd like to cite this or read it myself, but there's nothing to be found, and I have to Google some like term or like even just you know even if they say the you know scientists at this university and I'm like, who are they? I think I'm all up for more clarity. Um, so um, Jane, could you um, share another question with us? Thank you very much for, for the person that asked that. Uh, sure thing. Uh, okay, I'm gonna link two questions. Um, here the first one says, can you give example of successful correction? And then the second question is, how effective is a correction from a friend or family member on social media and messaging apps? In my experience, people do not like to be corrected. Maybe they feel their intelligence is questionable. Does anyone want to jump in and tackle this one? So I think we've got um, an example of, of a correction and then also something about coming from family and friends. Any takers? Go for it. Um, yeah, so Letitia Bode has done some work on this, so showing that, um, you know, it, it can be really effective if you see something on social media, see a post, um, and then you put the correction, you know, underneath, and that way, like, the audience who, who are looking at the post both sees the both, both the misinformation and the correction at the same time. Um, it's 
through. Like I'm always a, like a big fan of recommending if you're going to correct someone um, uh, to, to do it nicely. Um, there has been work to show that that doesn't reduce belief particularly more than if you say it in a nasty way. But my recommendation is there are other things to kind of aim for apart from just belief change. You're probably also trying to maintain relationships with these individuals and like it's, it's probably a good thing to kind of, you know, just, you know, why not? Um, uh, in terms of what's a successful correction, um, there's been some evidence to show that um, ironically, uh, um, kind of reminding people what the inaccurate thing is, and then saying it's false, and then saying the reason why is quite an effective structure. Um, that being said, a lot of these kind of uh, um, formatting recommendations of corrections often find like nothing. Um, but I mean, yeah, but if, if anything, it's some, sometimes when people are recommending this fact first structure, like to say like you put the correct information before you say the false information, it doesn't work that well because people don't know what you're talking about. You know, so you have to kind of like, it just makes sense. Like people need to know what you're correcting in order to correct it. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I guess it also touches upon this, this question of cues again, because um, you, you were touching upon the idea about um, older adults having kind of fewer, you know, stronger ties of people on social media that they follow. Um, is it, you know, how important is it who sends stuff to you? And, you know, if it's coming from a family member, are you more likely to be less critical? Like how, how, how did that social side of, of things work? Right. So I think the people closer to us obviously seem like more trustworthy sources than a stranger. So I think of course, that matters for young adults as well, right? Um, but my argument is just that older adults, by and large, are interacting mostly with close friends and family on their social media. They might not have strangers um, to interact with or to correct them on their feed. Um, but in general, I would recommend to just the average user um, to, to correct the older people in their lives if they see them sharing this information. Um, that might feel socially awkward in some situations, but I think it's important to do. They're voters as well. They're big voters. So you want right. to make sure they're informed. Um, you know, one of the other examples I was going to use in the introduction was this um, study that found that if you ask someone to write down a personal quality about themselves that they're proud of, they're more open to having their beliefs challenged. And it's kind of like this interesting um, example of, you know, just how it is hard to correct people. Because our beliefs are really personal to us as our, our identity. So, um, yeah, I think I, I, I wonder from that, you know, try not to be too attacking people and try to build someone up and be empathetic. Um, it's certainly part of the advice that we give um, at First Draft. Um, Jen, I think we have time for a couple of more questions, um, if you've got kind of final, final tea for us. Yeah, there are a few more. Okay, so we have one here. It says, how do you deal with misinformation shared by experts, say a doctor, but of homeopathy, or those in power, say elected leaders, especially because social media platforms might not be able to do anything concrete about it? So what should people, what should people do is, is the question. So how do you deal with misinformation shared by experts? Gotcha. Gotcha. Um, yeah, well, I mean, we've, we've seen a lot of, of, of misinformation from people in power. So um, this is a really relevant question. Um, do I have any takers from the panel on that or I'll pick someone? I, I, can, I can go ahead, I guess. Uh, <clears throat> um, the problem was that, so like let's take, let's take well, like climate change, for example, right? Like there's, um, we, we tend to trust experts. We would, you wouldn't cross a bridge that wasn't built by someone with relevant expertise. <clears throat> and at the same time, you know, we have almost all the scientists saying that this is a, this is a thing and humans are causing it and all that kind of stuff. And people don't believe them. And, the, and partly the reason I think for that is that they have, uh, there's a lot of expertise on the other side uh, that unfortunately has been kind of used and was used for a long time as kind of uh, false balance that would be created in, in the media. And so um, when you have uh, ostensible experts or at least trusted people saying things that are false, uh, we, need to, we need to communicate something about the weight of evidence 
you know, the, that there are other experts, not just one other person who disagrees, which makes it seem like 50-50, but like a lot of people, a lot of relevant experts are saying that it's wrong. So one expert isn't really that meaningful if you have, you know, thousands of them that are saying this is just one person, then that, that's, that's much more powerful. I mean, at least in theory, it, it, um, yeah. I think I would add that for better or for worse, I think people care less about expertise than we think they do. So, I mean, that works against us when we're trying to communicate correct information, but for us when it's misinformation. Yeah. Sorry, okay. jumping, on, jumping on that point, absolutely. Um, um, yeah, we've, we've seen like multiple times that, especially when correcting misinformation, it's trustworthiness that matters far more than expertise which is kind of, you know, it's, it's tricky because people build their trust in like different ways and we're still even working out how that works. Um, but it's not necessarily the fact that um, someone is, a, is a, even a perceived expert that, that matters all the time. Mm. Um, and I think, you know, really important why we need to be working with influencers because by definition, influencers are kind of people that are trusted. And I don't, I don't see people talking about that very much, um, but I definitely saw some misinformation coming from influencers at the beginning of the pandemic so um yeah i wonder if anyone listening is is is, is keen to take up that challenge um well thank you so much for such um interesting uh questions here um it's been really really great talking to you all um i um i wanted to kind of round off with some something really concrete um we've already actually touched on those concrete um things um, so I'm really happy for that, but, um, yeah, I wondered if we could kind of distill some of this down into kind of like your one piece of advice or your one thing you would want either a reporter or a fact checker or someone at a platform or someone, um, um, someone, someone else, maybe just even a, a member of the public. Um, so what's your one piece of advice? So can I ask, um, Bryony, can you, can you give us yours first? Oh man, just one. I don't know if I can, um, especially after all the tips I've, I've given. Um, um, obviously, the correct way, especially for fact checkers, that's a good thing. Um, but also repetition matters, like, you know, just saying it multiple times. Um, I think I think sometimes uh, fact checkers or the media in general are, are hesitant to feel like all oh, this has already been said, but not only will you be reaching new audiences, you'll probably be reaching new people to like that put in maybe slightly different search terms. Uh, but also we find that even repetition, like literally just saying the same correction, really helps to reduce and to keep that, that, um, that sustained belief change kind of low. Um, I think that's, yeah, that's a, something to keep in mind. Um, that's really, really helpful. Thank you. Thanks, Bryony. Um, I will be summing that up in my Twitter thread. Um, so correct, correct, correct. And repeat, repeat, repeat. <laughs> um, uh, Gordon, can I ask you to, um, to to share your one tip, your one piece of advice you want us to leave with? Sure. I think um, the way that we should be thinking about uh, like media consumers is not like <clears throat> the errors aren't because of, to put it in simple terms, like stupidity. I don't think. Like I think the the way that we need to be thinking about it is that there are people who probably have the capacity to to guess at least uh, whether it's true or false the, the thing that you're fact checking. Um, but they're just engaging in a very noisy information environment. And so like, and so um, really what you're fighting against is just getting things in front of people and like getting them to engage with it and getting them to stop and think about it, right? So it's not about, I mean, digital literacy is all, all that stuff's important, background knowledge is important, but the very first step is getting people to pay attention. And so um, that's something that I think, you know, we need to, we need to think about. And so it's glad that, it's good that we're, we have organizations like First Draft to, to do stuff like that because it's, yeah, that's it. We're, we're fighting a, a difficult battle, but uh, we're getting there, I think. So pay attention. We always need to pay a bit more attention to things. Um, yeah, I really like that idea. So, um, uh, and yeah, Nadia, can I ask you to round us off your, your tip, your one piece of advice? I think I would take Gord's advice and give it straight to users, right? Like slow down, read articles before you share them, um, check out the publisher. I don't know if anyone will actually follow that advice, um, but, and also call in the people that you're seeing sharing fake things, whether they're young or older. Mm. 
So we all just need to slow down a bit more. And um, yeah, this idea of calling in, I really like that. It's a, as opposed to calling out, I, I guess. Um, um, yeah, okay, great. Well, look, we're, we're, we're just about at the end of our, our time now. Um, I just want to say a massive thank you to our guests. Um, it was like, I felt like I was like starstruck when I realized who was going to be on this call. So like, I just really want to say thank you for finding time for us and just bringing some clarity. I think it's so important that we can understand this stuff and the clarity that you've been able to provide today is it's like immensely helpful. So thank you all um, so much.